There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that you can kind of choose the way you get fat. Like that's quite frankly ridiculous. This is the problem with people who pick out mechanistic data and use this to drive a narrative. You can literally find a mechanism for anything to prove whatever you want. Because mechanisms are only small parts of the story. The summation of all the mechanisms is shows up as human outcome data. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Welcome to the very first quickie episode, a shorter bite-sized version of The Proof, where we tackle one single topic in around 20 minutes or less. Today I sit down with Lane Norton, PhD, to talk about some recent claims made online by Ben Bickman, PhD, about insulin and seed oils. Bickman, a low-carbohydrate diet advocate, took to social media to tell people that both insulin and seed oils cause our fat cells to increase in size. As you'll hear in this conversation, the more technical term for referring to a fat cell that increases in size is adipocyte hypertrophy. Adipocyte being a fat cell and hypertrophy meaning to grow in size. The specific claim Bickman made was keep insulin low and control seed oils and fat cells can stay smaller and healthier. This sounds amazing. Adopt a low-carb diet, keep insulin low, and avoid seed oils, and we could cure metabolic disease and obesity. But is this really an accurate reflection of where the evidence lies? Following several people in the community sending me this post, I reached out to Lane Norton, friend of the pod, to help us go through the claims and clear any confusion. Please enjoy. This is me and Lane Norton. Hey, Lane, welcome to the quick version of this show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate you having me. So let's dive straight into things here. I, I recently saw a little bit of a, a back and forth on, on Twitter between you and Dr. Ben Bickman, who is a, a professor and a biomedical scientist, I believe, and he seems to be interested in, in metabolic health and is a a big proponent from what I can see of low carb diets. He has quite a large following online and I did a little bit of research and it seems that the two of you have had some dialogue previously where you have kind of disagreed on, on a few things and um, I couldn't find anything where or anywhere where the two of you had had a verbal conversation about this. So I invited both of you on, you said yes, he didn't uh, reply so here we are. Let's, let's start with the most recent claims that Bigman made. And here's a direct quote, Lane. Keep insulin low and control seed oils and fat cells can stay smaller and healthier. Keep the insulin low and control the seed oils and fat cells can stay smaller and healthier. Give me a very quick soundbite. What's your initial reaction to that? This is like two truths and a lie, or sorry, a truth and two lies, basically. So he said, you know, small adipocytes are still metabolically healthy. So you're better off at the same fat mass, and I I don't want to, I'm probably not going to get the quote exactly right, but at the same fat mass, you're better off having more smaller fat cells than you are smaller number of large fat cells. And two things control that. Uh, Linoleic acid, which is from seed oils, and uh, insulin. There are two variables, chronically elevated insulin and linoleic acid, the primary polyunsaturated fat from seed oils. Both of these molecules through two totally different mechanisms will push fat cells to go from hyperplasia, which is small but more abundant, to few and large. Now, uh, I couldn't really find (laughs) much evidence other than some really weak mechanistic evidence on linoleic acid. And as far as insulin goes, um, yeah, it's, it's well known that insulin can drive free fatty acids into adipocytes. However, we're, I'll, I'll discuss why that doesn't really matter outside the context of energy balance. Now, what I found really disingenuous about what he was saying is he's speaking as if 
if you're going to gain fat, you're better off having hyperplasia than hypertrophy. Right. Okay. There is absolutely no... First off, we don't even know if hyperplasia happens in adult humans. We suspect that it may in very obese people and possibly even people who go through periods of yo-yo dieting. But there's like the idea that you can control whether or not you have hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that you can kind of choose the way you get fat. Like that's quite frankly ridiculous. Um, and as far as the whole, you know, insulin um, goes, it, w this is the problem with people who pick out mechanistic data and use this to drive a narrative. You can literally find a mechanism for anything to prove whatever you want because mechanisms are only small parts of the story. The summation of all the mechanisms is shows up as human outcome data. So let's just look at the human outcome data because we have trials where they equate calories and protein and vary the amount of carbohydrate and fat and very conclusively show that there's no difference in fat loss or fat gain from overfeeding or underfeeding carbohydrate versus fat. So who cares about like one mechanism out of thousands? Right. So just to kind of clarify this for, for listeners who may not have seen the, the the different claims that he was making in that tweet. So there's two parts. The first part, as you summarized, is that he's essentially saying that we can select between hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Um, you're saying that that's not true. The second claim he's saying is that in order to to sort of avoid this hypertrophy, and to promote hyperplasia instead, we would want to reduce our exposure to insulin or to two compounds. One is insulin and the second is linoleic acid, which is um, often said in the same sentence as seed oils, even though it is found in, in other foods um, as well. So with regards, I understand what you're saying there about hyperplasia and, and hypertrophy. Um, with regards to that second claim to do with those two compounds, he says both of these molecules push fat cells to go from hyperplasia to hypertrophy. So what, what evidence have you seen that he's using to make that claim? Because that's a, that's a particularly strong claim to be making. Yeah, basically the evidence he's using is in vitro cell line data um, and maybe some rodent data, but no human data whatsoever. Um, the, the, the idea that linoleic acid is doing this, I mean, if that were true, we could just go look and see populations that eat high amounts of linoleic acid. And the research says, if anything, they're actually leaner. So, right. you know, that <laughs> like, it just doesn't hold up when you actually look at the actual outcome data. Now, I'm not saying people should go out and pound down linoleic acid because I know how people are going to straw man me. Um, the other thing I'll say is he seems to understand adipose cell uh, or adipocyte uh, uh, biology somewhat well, but he completely neglects other portions of it. For example, like this idea that hyperplasia is better. If you create more fat cells, most of the research we have suggests that your kind of body fat settling point is determined by fat cell size. And if you create, if let's say that you could create more fat cells, the research actually suggests that you would continue to gain fat uh, or your, your, because small fat cells secrete less leptin. And so your body would actually still sense like some sort of quote unquote deficit. So uh, I mean, we see this in, when, in animal models where they increase the number of fat cells. They tend to continue to gain fat until each cell until the average diameter of each cell is about 100 microns, which is kind of like where things like to sit in these animals. Right. Okay, so can you just explain that to me again? So when you have a larger number of fewer fat cells, do you say you get less leptin? Yeah, so the, the research suggests that a lot of the – secretion of leptin is driven by the fat cell size. So larger fat cells secrete more leptin. Now, the downside to that is you tend to become less leptin sensitive. 
it really, I don't want to make too big of a claim about leptin because it tends to be something that's responsive rather than driving these responses. Okay. Um, so, but the research that I've seen, even in rodents, sh- demonstrates that if you add more fat cells, if you increase the fat cell number, uh, again, there, there's, a, there's a study by McLean um, where they kind of took rats through basically a yo-yo dieting cycle and actually were able to show fat cell hyperplasia. What's interesting is those animals did not return to their previous, so they had them diet down, they lost a certain amount of their body weight, and then they kind of let them ad libitum feed. And so they gained weight very quickly and actually induced fat cell hyperplasia. Now, I'm not saying that this happens in humans because there's no evidence it happens in humans in this condition. But when they st- before weight loss, pre-weight loss, their adipocytes were right about 100 microns in diameter. And then when they were finished with weight loss, it was like 85 microns in diameter. And then they added more fat cells. What's really interesting is they did not stop regaining weight until their average fat cell diameter returned to the pre-diet levels. Only now, since they had more fat cells, the overall fat mass was greater. So it really suggests that your body kind of likes this, has a, I don't want to generalize too much, but has kind of a native size of your fat cells that it likes to maintain. And part of that may be driven by, you know, fat adipocytes don't just like float around in your body. They're scaffolded onto your, like an extracellular matrix. And when you lose weight or gain weight, if it gets too, um, if it's too much or too, or, sorry, if you lose too much or gain too much, it actually places a stress on this matrix that tends to drive you back towards what you originally were in terms of like, it affects different hormonal pathways, leptin, so on and so forth. So your appetite goes up or down in response. Now, humans, because of the hyperpalatable nature of our environment, can sometimes eat themselves past that. Right. But it's just, again, I'm pointing out a mechanism, but the reason I'm pointing it out is because it just goes to show, like, I can find a mechanism to support my st- what I'm claiming too, right? Only the, the only difference is I'm not making a strong claim. I'm just saying there's no research to back up the direct claim that he's making. Okay. And what would it take? So if there was research to support his claim, looking at human health outcomes, what would that study look like? So really what you would have to do is you, you'd probably be looking, I mean, ideally you'd kind of have uh, a control group and then four different groups. You'd have uh, low seed oil, low, or low linoleic acid, low insulin, uh, or sorry, low carbohydrate, uh, high linoleic acid, high carbohydrate, low linoleic acid, high carbohydrate, and then high linoleic acid, high linoleic acid, low carbohydrate. So you're kind of right. spanning that, that bridge. Right. And then based on what he's saying, if you did this, you know, over, I don't know, six months, something like that, and you took a fat cell biopsy of a certain area of fat cells, what or a certain, like if you took out a certain, um, like gram amount, like excise, let's say a hundred grams of adipose tissue, what you should see, according to him, is it in the high insulin, high linoleic acid group, you would have more fat cells in that in that 100 grams of fat mass, and they would be smaller in diameter than, say, the other group, which should right. be more hypertrophied. Um, but that study, to my knowledge, does not exist. Does that even really matter, Lane? Like, I, know, I, I realize like a study like Diet Fits, for example, that compared a lower carbohydrate diet to a higher carbohydrate diet over the 12 months, the average weight loss was not significantly different between the two groups. Is that enough information for us? Or do you feel like we have to go to that extra layer, that extra <laughs> level deeper to look at fat cells? Is it, is it actually important? Uh, again, you really pointed out the, the, you really pointed out the most pertinent point, which is who cares? <laughs> uh, we have the human outcome data. We have over 20 studies looking at comparing low carb versus high carb and everything in between with calories and protein equated. And if what, uh, if what these guys are saying is true, you know, you would think you would see like big differences in fat loss or fat gain. And you just don't, there's no difference. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty darn clear. And so again, it's what, and if you look at the markers of metabolic health, I mean, even in diet fits, you know, not really different, 
Like it seems to be mostly, and I don't want to say exclusively because that's not true. There, there may be some unique benefits of low carb on say HbA1c, and there may be some unique benefits of low fat on like LDL cholesterol. So, sure. you know, but they're, they're pretty modest in comparison to the weight loss itself. So yeah. really like what you just said, like all this is doing this information is just confusing people to focus on the wrong things. Which kind of brings me to some of the last questions I have here. Why is this problematic? I mean, you spend an enormous amount of time going through this information, addressing it, and you you might put up a 60-second or a two-minute video, but it takes a lot longer than that for you to go through, look at their claims, look at their research, look at the overall totality of the evidence, and then create that content. What's the impact that this information could have on someone if they just take it at face value because someone might be thinking in well and someone might be listening and thinking well lane really he's just telling people to you know avoid ultra processed foods and seed oils is it really that bad yeah great great question and what i always say is misinformation always has unintended consequences even if the intentions are good so i don't really care about people's intentions because um hitler had good intentions uh, you know, like not, I'm, I realize this is a non-equivalence fallacy, but the point is nobody believes they're doing the wrong thing. Very, very few people do the wrong thing and say, ah, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. They twist it around in their mind is how it's the right thing. Now, in this case, um, I think the, the problem is you create this fear around these foods. And again, you get people focusing on the wrong things, you know, that well, I'm not going to have seed oils, but, you know, butter and, and bacon and a bunch of saturated fat is fine. And I don't have to worry about calories because it's all about insulin. And you get, I mean, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ethan Suplee, um, but he's a Hollywood actor who lost over 300 pounds and he'd been on every different diet. And he said, you know, I went down the low carb rabbit hole and I, you know, I got stuck and couldn't lose weight. And I thought it was, you know, the I thought it was the veggies in my salad that were keeping me from losing weight. And, you know, looking back, I'm, I feel like such a moron because it was all the oil and butter and bacon that I was having that was, you know, stopping me from losing fat because I was over consuming calories. And right. so I really, I try to emphasize, hey, every, every different approach works. Like you don't, like these people who are so dogmatic about this is the only way that can work. I'm like, do you have eyes? Because... <laughs> Like you can just go look at other people who have lost weight from every different methodology out there, you know? And so what that says is everything works, but it's important for us to be honest about why it works because otherwise people start making these weird associations in their heads. And I see the downstream effects of that largely in just kind of disordered eating patterns. Um, I, I realize that's not like a really popular thing to talk about, but um, I mean, I work with a lot of people. I have worked with a lot of people over the course of my career. My wife's worked with a lot of people over the course of her career. And I mean, maybe they wouldn't be diagnosed like a, a, like a, like a DSM, but I would say that they were, you know, had some kind of form, like 50% of them probably had some form of disordered eating or disordered eating habits. And a lot of it was based around misinformation that they had heard and they'd formed weird associations with food in their mind. I'll, I'll never forget... <laughs> I had somebody who was convinced that um, gluten made them fat. And they'd always say, well, if I eat a bunch of gluten, I, I, gain, I always gain weight. And I'm like, well, when do you, when do you typically eat gluten? And it would be like, well, you know, last week I, I caved on my diet and I ate a pizza. And I'm like, so you ate the whole pizza and you were surprised that you didn't feel good afterwards and that you gained weight. Do you think it was the gluten or do you think it was, you know, the, the 2,000 calories in the pizza? And so I said, you know, here, do me a favor, like have two slices of bread tonight before you go to bed. And let me know if, you know, if you have a response. And I said, like, oh, my gosh, I'm not gluten intolerant. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. You know, <laughs> so it's like people can draw these weird associations in their mind if, you know, we're not careful about how we present the information. Right. Yeah. It's the, the old case of the absolute selling and the oversimplified message. Somet sometimes I kind of understand where people are coming from because I think they think if they speak with a lot of nuance then it's too hard for someone to sort of grab a hold of but then the the flip side of that is 
an oversimplified message, as you say, which is then conflicting with the next oversimplified message, which conflicts with the next one. And, you know, people just end up not knowing who to, to trust or believe. So back to, back to Bickman here. What do you think the primary motive is behind his position that insulin and linoleic acid are uniquely a problem? Do you think that as a scientist he genuinely believes that position or is he sort of trying to find mechanistic evidence to support a diet of choice that may have worked for him and, and worked for people in his community? Uh, both things can be true. So I, I would, I would, I've kind of... Um I've kind of changed my tune over the years, which I used to think like the people that did this sort of stuff, that they were all just money hungry and this was a ploy, you know, this was a way for them to make money. And what you realize is not everybody's motivated by money necessarily. Uh, for some people, they, you know, it's uh, a fame thing or like just the positive feedback they receive from that community. Because, I mean, you, you probably know this, like if you're kind of in the extreme plant based community, if you pander to that audience and that's most of your audience, I mean, you get a lot of really positive feedback. You know right. what I mean? And so that's very motivating for some people. When you sit in the middle is when you tend to get a lot of the criticism, you know? Um, so I, I think, you know, it's impossible for me to know what kind of his motivations are. I would suspect because I've been guilty of cognitive dissonance before when I was younger. And a lot of it was driven by just what you said. I found something that kind of worked for me and just assumed that that would work for everybody else. And then I just kind of started retroactively trying to find, you know, the studies that confirmed what I already believed to be true. We, uh, that's called confirmation bias. And that's how most people go about it. It's they, they form a belief based on their own personal experience. And then they look for the science to support that. And what I'll always say is, if you're so positive about it, why do you even need science to support it? If you liked it and it worked for you, what's why do you feel the need to prove that it's the best thing since sliced bread? You know it works for you. Fantastic. But just don't assume it's going to work for everybody else. And I'm not saying, you know, people say, oh, this worked for me or that didn't work for me. And they, they think physiological. And really what it boils down to, and we know this from the data very clearly, it's an adherence thing. They just found a diet that, quote unquote, felt easy to them. I had a conversation with Christopher Gardner about diet fits and that seemed to be where he was leaning as well. Like they looked at genetics, they looked at insulin resistance to see if any of that could explain why did someone do better on low carb or high carb and and as a team they were left thinking this is likely behavioral, you know, at home. Why could someone at home do well on a low carb diet well maybe their family didn't give them a hard time ab about it and other people in the family were eating like that and it was accepted in their friendship group etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that's a great point lane thank you so much uh for doing this i think i might have to get you back on next time to to chat about fructose and, uh, yes. and metabolic health so um fantastic we'll, we'll schedule schedule you back in sounds great simon thank you for having me thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.